worship together. So let us now worship God with heart and hand and voice. I invite you to rise in body or spirit, however you are called, as we join together in our call to worship. God calls us to service rather than honor. God calls us to love the stranger rather than the familiar. God calls us to worship, trusting in the grace of Jesus Christ.
be seated. We come to worship God singing praise, looking for God's glory, and also aware of the lack of glory within ourselves. So with humility, thinking of who we are, and with great faith, thinking of who God is, let us pray together. Merciful God, in Jesus you show us a way that is humble and seeks the good of others. We confess that we do not follow his example. We go our own way. We elevate ourselves over others and ignore the needs of the world. Forgive us. Free us from the temptation to pursue our own pleasure exclusively. Help us to live in harmony with all people sharing one world and eating around one table with Jesus Christ, our host and savior. Amen. With abundant grace and mercy, reaching wide and deep, God gathers us and cleanses us, making us new and whole. This is good news. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. may be seated as we continue worship with a time of prayer. O Lord, humble my heart, that I might not think of myself as a proud preening peacock, so gifted, so talented, so brilliant as an orator that I have been chosen to read your word. O Lord, humble our hearts, that we may not think of ourselves as so luminous, so wonderful, so brilliant, that we have the only truth, the only way, the only light. Instead, help us to understand what it is to be one of your children, part of the great fabric and tapestry of humanity. Not that it is about our individual glory, but about how you have given us gifts, we have nurtured and cultivated them, and together we sing and pray and speak and bring all honor and glory to you forever and ever. Amen. Listen to the word of God, inspired by the Spirit, spoken through this text from Hebrews. Keep loving each other like you love family. Don't neglect to open your homes to guests, because by doing this, some have been hosts to angels without even knowing it. Remember, prisoners as if you were in prison with them, and people who are mistreated as if you were in their place. Marriage must be honored in every respect, with no cheating on the relationship. 
because God will judge the sexually immoral person and the person who commits adultery. Your way of life should be free from the love of money, and you should be content with what you have. After all, God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. This is why we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, and I won't be afraid. What can people do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke God's word to you. Imitate their faith as you consider the way their lives turned out. Jesus Christ is the same forever, yesterday, today, and forever. Don't be misled by the many strange teachings that are out there. It's a good thing for the heart to be strengthened by grace rather than by food. Food doesn't help those who live in this context. We have an altar, and those who serve as priests in the meeting tent don't have the right to eat from it. The blood of the animals is carried into the Holy of Holies by the high priest as an offering for sin, and their bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy with his own blood. So now let's let go, and let's go to him outside the camp bearing his shame. We don't have a permanent city here, but rather we are looking for the city that is still to come. So let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise through him, which is the fruit from our lips that confess his name. Don't forget to do good and share what you have, because God is pleased with these kinds of sacrifices. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. At this time, I would like to invite all our children to come forward and join me right in this space for our time for children. As you come forward, if you have an offering that you would like to share, we continue to support the Thornwell Building Families Ministry, and they will be with us partnering in Sunday School today. So if you'd like to help that, you can put the, um, your offering into that um, bucket, and it is most appreciated. Thank you, thank you. It is so good to see everybody today. I bet each and every one of you is good at something. And I'm willing to bet that each and every one of you is great at something. Because everybody has something they're pretty good at and something they're really, really good at. Right? You probably know somebody who's really good at telling stories. You probably know somebody who's pretty good at singing. You probably know somebody who's pretty good at building stuff or making stuff or teaching you stuff. There's all kinds of things that you can be good at. What are you good at? Uh, You're good at building? Okay. What else? I didn't hear you, Hannah. Oh, your Bubba's good at something? What are you good at, Connor? Collecting Pokemon cards. You're good at collecting Pokemon cards. All right. You have to know a lot to know a lot to do that. Well, I am really good at knitting. Really good. I can make patterns. I can do designs. I can make work that looks like it was made on a machine, but I actually made it. I can do a lot of things there. And today we talked about being humble. Does it sound like I'm being humble when I say I'm really good at that? Well, when I grew up, people told me if you're good at something, you should never tell other people that you're good about that because that's not humility, that's being proud. And I think they're wrong. Because here's the deal. When somebody gives you a compliment, you should always be grateful. If somebody sees something in you, they are seeing God doing something amazing and they say, Connor, you're really good at collecting Pokemon cards. And you should say, thank you, I'm blessed. That is the perfect, humble response. And if somebody says, well, what does that mean? Why are you saying it like that? You can say, well, I say thank you because I'm grateful that you saw something. And I say I'm blessed because there's a whole world and community that helped make that gift possible. I told you I was good at knitting, right? Yeah. 
Why am I good at knitting? Because I had a grandmother who taught me how to knit. I had YouTube, which showed me a lot of new techniques. Other people created all those videos. Somebody else helped make all that technology that made that possible. I had enough resources to get yarn, to learn from other teachers, to have the time to do it, to have the space to do it, to have people to make things for, all of that. And if I just say, yep, I'm awesome, <laughs> that's not humble. That makes it all about me. But when I say, thank you, I'm blessed, it says, thank you for helping me see that gift and for letting me be able to share that with you. So if you're really good at running and someone says, you're great at running, you can say, thank you, I'm blessed. If you're really good at building, you can say, thank you, I'm blessed. Humble means we share the gift and show how it was a community that helped make it possible and we were part of it. Take the hand of somebody next to you. Take the other hand of the other person next to you. And recognize that you were connected as a community. You would not be here without each other. So holding hands, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the friend on my right, for the friend on my left, for all in front of me, all behind me, all around me. We are blessed. Thank you. Amen. You are welcome to go back to your families or where you need to go to experience the rest of our worship together. The second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke in the 14th chapter. I'm going to read the first verse and then skip to the seventh. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to share a meal in the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely. When Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by that host. The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you'll take your seat in the least important place. Instead, When you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place. When your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. Then Jesus said to the person who had invited him, when you host a lunch or dinner, Don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, lame and blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Instead, you will be repaid when the just are resurrected. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You have probably heard this standard conversation starter to name three people, living or dead, whom you would like to invite to dinner. The conversation prompt is, Standard fare amongst youth groups and college students and people-mixing activities. 
It's a fun quandary that brings insight into those making the invitations. Although the game is never played in reverse, a list of three people whom we would not welcome to dinner, that would be an interesting exercise too. That list would likely be populated by those who have the of our time and attention, people whom we have called names and thrown to the side of our minds in an attempt to put as much distance as possible between us. I'm sorry to say that the latter list is the one Jesus calls us to attend in this gospel passage. When you host a meal or give a party, do not invite your friends or relatives or rich neighbors. Don't invest in social capital. Don't ask yourself, what can this guest do for me? Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite the untouchables, the misfits, the people who live in the bad neighborhoods of town. Invite the people you ignore and patronize the ones you avoid and hurry past. Jesus said, you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. It certainly seems like something Jesus would say because it is exactly what God has done for us. God is blessed because God has fed those who cannot repay God. God is blessed because God has given to those who cannot give back. Jesus is blessed because Jesus healed the sick, though they could not heal or fix him. Jesus fed the hungry, though there are few mentions of strangers tending to his bodily needs. Jesus touched the untouchables and offered compassion to the brokenhearted, and they did not repay him. In fact... You know, everyone abandoned him in his hours of greatest needs on trial and nearing death. Though Jesus never abandoned anyone, he never abandoned creation. <coughs> the host who played the guest opened his arms wide and gave such abundance that he emptied himself entirely on behalf of the guests who played the host. In most social circles, it's important to understand one's role, the hierarchies at play, and the mechanisms that balance the relationships. I, and probably you, have been schooled on how to be a good guest I bring a hostess gift. I write a thank you note. I behave in such a way, usually, that I might be invited back for a future occasion or later invite the host to something of my own. I know that the people with whom I socialize are generally considered my peers. We equally give and take from one another. Rarely. Do I attend something beyond my circle of influence? I would never be invited to a White House state dinner or the Kennedy Center honor celebration, though I'd love to attend either of those grand national affairs if anyone is listening and cares. Neither would I be invited to a pop-up house concert in a teenage band's garage. In part, it's because neither of those circles know that I exist. But also, it's because our practice of hospitality has a strong connection to social identity and awareness. We're expected to know our place and be content there. But that is not gospel. Christ's kingdom's social circles know only the bounds of grace and mercy, compassion and humility. Pride has no place here. Judgment 
has no place here. Better than and worse than is a false dichotomy at Christ's table. If God is our creator and host, our almighty judge and savior, we are all less than God. We don't deserve to be invited to the table, and yet Christ invites each of us, all of us, to his eternal feast. Jesus opens his arms wide enough for the worst offenders to find forgiveness and a place at the table. So we come to life itself. We come to worship. We come to the table with true humility. We don't come and say, no, oh, I don't deserve this, secretly believing that we are equal to God's station and worthy of this incredible honor. No. We come into God's presence with gratitude and humility that even we would be included in this gracious invitation. And as we take our seat, we notice that people from every time and place are also standing around Christ's table, people whom we have judged at one time, but now see are the same as us. All of us are creatures from the wrong side of salvation's tracks, but we have been drugged through the kingdom's gates by Christ's determination, so we all sit down ready to eat humble pie yet finding ourselves served an incredible feast of eternal love. This is why we approach God's throne with humility, not gamemanship or one-upmanship, but true humility that acknowledges from whence we've come and accepts that we are still welcome. It takes humility to admit that we are not equal to God, the giver of all goodness. It takes humility to receive God's goodness, knowing that we cannot repay or return it with any equality. Our word humility comes from the Latin word humus, which means earth or soil. Human, humanity are related to the same word, humus. Humility, like our humanity, is etymologically rooted in rich soil that brings life. Humility is deceptively simple. It, it looks like nothing, just something that lies on the lowest of things in life. And yet humility is teeming with potential. Humility is a nursery for growing strong minds and backs. It leads to learning that roots down and shoots up as tall as the sky, thickening with age and experience. We know that there is nothing we can do to repay God for the gifts of life and salvation. About the only meaningful thing we can do is to pay it forward as we love and serve others. And that is gospel hospitality. That is God's kingdom's lifestyle. Jesus invites us to break the rules of what have you done for me lately? And then do to others because we are all children of God. This is the way God treats us, nurturing us, forgiving us, filling us, even though we cannot nurture, forgive, and fill God. The great theologian and author Henry Nouwen once told a story about an unexpected guest who knocked on his door early one morning. He opened his door and found a woman standing there who said she was sent from a mutual friend. Nouwen didn't know the woman. He didn't plan to have guests. He had a whole day of work ahead of him. But the woman asked if she could come in. And Nowen said, yes, but I have a meeting shortly, and I have a class to teach after that, and then I'm booked until supper time, i.e., don't hang around very long. The woman said, that's not a problem, and she came in. 
She then told Mr. Nowen that he should go on with his plans and just leave her there in his house. Many of us would probably say, mm, no thank you, or direct a stranger to a local sightseeing. But Nowen said, okay. So he left and went about his day forgetting about the stranger in his home. When he returned that evening, he opened the door to find his table set for a beautiful dinner with fine linen cloth, candles, formal china, good wine. He was astonished. He asked, what's this? To which the stranger replied, I thought we could have dinner together. The woman spent the day preparing a lovely meal for her host. Unknown before that day and largely unknown to one another before the meal itself, the guest became the host and the host became the guest. Humble hospitality. Christ calls us to not just serve the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. He goes farther to call us to invite the untouchables, the misfits, the people we ignore and patronize, the ones we avoid and hurry past into our own homes and private spaces. Christ calls us not just to keep people at an arm's length, but to bring them in to our intimate space, just as he had done for us. May we delight in finding ourselves humble guests at Christ's table this week. May we also do the work, the hard work, of humbly hosting others. May we give as God has given to us, serving as Christ served us, without any need for compensation or reward. We will be blessed with life eternal in God's kingdom, our right and true home. May it be so. Amen.
as part of God's beautiful creation, surrounded by sisters and brothers, walking together as children of light. Let us affirm our faith using words from the brief statement of faith found in your bulletins. Christians, what do we believe? We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves, to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all people to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Please be seated as we continue worship with prayer. O Lord, let the words of my mouth echo the songs of the heart played out on each of your children's breath. Let our prayers today not be mine, but ours and yours. Hear our prayers, O Lord. We pray with the people whose voices are heard prominently, for people who lead, who tweet, who clamor, who shout, for people who have millions of followers in the world, in the technical spaces of social media, in the virtual spaces and the realities, for all those who are easy to hear, beautiful to look at, lovely to behold, we lift up our prayers for your blessings, your care, and your continued love and presence. For the people who are invisible and nearly invisible. For our sisters and brothers who we walk by on the street and think, oh, how hard it must be. What a shame. Oh, how tragic. For the hands that are open, begging for help. For our hands, which are tucked in pockets and our eyes downcast as we walk by afraid that making eye contact might remind us of our shared humanity, might slow us from our muchness and mininess, our busyness, our hurry, and force us into compassion, relationship, and pause. For all who are seen and unseen, O oh Lord, may your blessings fall. May food be on every table, water quenching every throat and thirst. May a roof be over every head. And may the hands and feet that make this possible be mine and ours. O oh Lord, we lift up our bank accounts, whether those are plush and full, whether those are fearful and trembling, whether those are negative or empty knowing that these are artificial creations of human systems. We lift them up and sacrifice them and give them to you, praying, come, Lord Jesus, take, transform. For we know that when we are born into this world, we carry with us the greatest gift, your breath, the spirit, life itself. 
When we go from this world to the next, we humbly return that gift and transition from this life to the life which never ends. And in between, we become stewards of all the things that distract and empower us to believe that we are in control. So in our prayers, help us to let go, to return and to rely on you, that we may be humble servants, givers and renewers of life, that we may taste and see that you are good and that the blessings never cease. For the truth of the gifts of the Spirit is that the more they are shared, the more they grow in abundance. Guide us with love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, generosity, self-control, that we might be the light that you call us to be, that we may be the child you created us to be, that we may be the love that you have for us and all your children, praying the prayer that you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this daily, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are all temporary stewards of the gifts that we are given. When we come to the table, when we come to the sacred place, when we come online to these spaces of meeting, we find there is always an invitation to give of ourselves, to return what was never ours, to let go of the things that become burdens when we hold them too closely. So with joy, share the blessings that you have been giving. Share your time, share your talents, share your treasures, and as you do, say, thank you, I am blessed. Thank you, we are blessed. Thank you for the gift of being a servant together. And thank you for all the gifts that you give to help support this church, the ministry of Christ as it is reflected through St. Giles, and the ministry that we share together. Thank you, for we are blessed. Let us share our tithes, our offerings, and all that we have with God this day.
Holy One, Holy Three, as we lift our offerings before you today, we pray that it would be enough just to give, that it would be enough just to serve, that it would be enough to humbly be part of your broken, fledgling church this day. May all that we do, all that we are, all that we have glorify your name here and around the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what does the Lord require of us? To do, to do justice, justice, to love, love kindness, kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. God. Because God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. In that last hymn, we sang the phrase, let courage be our daily breath. And you need a good heap helping of courage to practice hospitality with humility to be able to talk to people at school who are outside of your group of friends and say, hey, let's hang out. <laughs> to talk to people who are in your office who are definitely not part of your circle in the office and say, hey, how are you doing? How can I help you? How can I serve you? That's really hard work. It takes courage to stop driving your car when you see someone on the sidewalk who obviously needs help and yet you are in a hurry and have better things to do. It takes courage to make financial sacrifices to support other people in the community who don't have finances to make sacrifices with. This is our charge, to be hospitable in the way that God has been hospitable to us, with humility, 
without the need for a pat on the back or any kind of repayment. As you go out the de- this day with courage, may the love of God surround you, the peace of Christ support you, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit overshadow you this day, now, and forever. Amen.